which are widespread throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. These are model systems uh, throughout the world. These frogs are exported for studying in labs. And so I do a lot of taxonomy projects related to Xenopus. These are aquatic frogs, so I don't know if you can quite tell, but it's floating in water. And you can see the little bit of water. Its eyes are just projecting above the level of the water. And this is, gives you also a nice sense of why sometimes it's nice to photograph uh, aquatic animals in water. So you're really getting the behavioral of, of this animal by letting it sit in water for a photograph. You see this, they have these nice little tentacles that if it was um, out of water, you wouldn't be able to see. It's, this is its typical body posture with its legs spread out. You can see these little claws on its toes for which they're named clawed frogs and poking its eyes right above the surface of the water. So this is a very natural image um, of this guy. A related genus, is Hymenochirus, which looks really nothing like a Xenopus. They're strange little aquatic frogs. And we turn these up most of the time by dip netting. They're very hard to see, but as Rafe mentioned, we'll use uh, nets, and I'll show you some nets in a moment. We use nets for actually dipping in water catching to catch tadpoles. But in this part of Africa, we can also turn up things like Hymenochirus that are otherwise hard to find. And then just to give you a sense of the sort of uh, arboreal, uh, things that live in trees or on bushes that we'd encounter, things like Hyperoleus, uh, Leptopelus, Hyperoleus, this is another species of Hyperoleus. A lot of these species, for many, many years, we thought about these these and these as different species. And depending on where you are in Africa, uh, people are very confused by the fact that males look different than females and different populations look different from other populations. And so this is one of the reasons now that it's really important for us to have photographs in life, especially of males and females together mating. This is in Amplexus. So you, we have these pictures of these individuals together we can take genetic data from them and know that they're in fact the same species. We can have calls of these individuals to know what these species sound like and then we can match it up across populations and we can actually understand that even though populations vary in what they look like, they're actually all the same species. Whereas a hundred years ago, people were simply confused so much that every single population basically was a different species. But in fact, now we know there are wide ranging populations that vary in what they look like. So it's really important for us to string together these pieces of information like photographs, calls, tissues, all associated with these specimens. That, and we'll talk more about how we do that tomorrow. There's also some real beaut really beautiful animals, like uh, this is a Christatus chameleon, Southern Cameron. We should, I think, encounter these, you think, Walter? Yeah? Um, they're a lot of fun, they're beautiful. Uh, and snakes, like Dipsidoboa, we find these at night um, in sort of bushes. The other thing that uh, we spend time looking for, and we basically have an entirely different sampling strategy for, are Sicilians. So if you want to find Sicilians, these are amphibians. They look like a cross between a snake and an earthworm. So hopefully we'll see some while we're in the field. Rafe mentioned one in uh, the Philippines. For, in Cameroon, we have completely terrestrial Sicilians. I think, I think none of those have larvae. So they all have little eggs from which hatch Sicilians, and they're all terrestrial. And so to find these animals, you have to dig, and you have to spend a lot of time digging. Otherwise, it's very, very uncommon to encounter these animals in the wild. So it's not like you can just run a transect and hope that while you're walking the transect, you're going to come across a Sicilian. That just doesn't happen. So what we do is we you know, clear areas of the forest where it seems like the soil is suitable near streams, and we spend a lot of time then digging down within about two feet of the surface of the soil looking for them. And you can turn up animals like this. This is a herpele. Uh, so there's two species that are common in the areas that we'd be going in corrupt, herpele and another thing uh, called geotripedes. So I'm going to say just in the last bit for me um, a little bit about field equipment and just kind of show you some of what we have and, and begin to hopefully get your ideas going about how even you know, if you're in Cameroon or in Uganda or in Ghana, that you can generate a lot of these field supplies yourselves without having to have them brought in, um, you know, expensively from another country. So one of the, I guess, just to talk about it quickly, you know, things that are almost the fundamentals that we use for field equipment um, are rubber boots and headlamps. So we spend a lot of time going out at night and um, Rafe and I both work a lot with these very high powered headlamps give you an idea of what they look like. Um, these very bright headlamps have these external batteries and we turn them on. This is, that's a pretty bright headlamp, right? Um, so we can really light up the forest quite a lot at night with these headlamps. Um, we also use, you know, lower, lower powered headlamps as much as we can. Um, but a lot of times they're just not very effective for seeing through all of the, the trees and bushes at night. 
Um, we use rubber boots for sampling in streams. It's nice to have closed-toed shoes sometimes when you sample in streams. Depending on where you are, you don't want to get schistosomiasis. Um, we use notebooks uh, just for jotting down things in the field all the time. So, so town, town has mentioned, you know, having like rag paper. It's like heavy-duty paper. So I, a lot of times in the field, just use, use little notebooks like this that fit into a pack that I can write on and they're, they're not going to tear um, because they get wet. So we use these notebooks quite a lot in the field. Um, GPS, which we'll spend a lot of time talking about, and bags. And so bags for herpetology are like a really important element of herpetology. Uh, so there's a lot of different versions of that. Let me see if I can find them real quick. Oh, my headlamp is turning on. Um, so some of them are just things like this, just plastic bags so we can buy them in grocery stores. Some of the bags that um, Rafe showed look like this, which we, we can get in the US. They're aquarium bags. They're actually used for transporting tropical fish. And so we can order a lot of those and bring them with us. But I want to emphasize that while you might not have a supply of aquarium bags here in Cameroon, you can have them made yourself. And so uh, two years ago, for whatever reason, we didn't have enough of these bags when he came. And so we found a guy in a market in Yaoundé that just simply made bags for us uh, quite cheaply. So for those of you that I know we were talking about Puff Puff at lunch, if you buy Puff Puff on the street, they come in these very thin plastic bags. Those are no good for putting frogs in. If they jump once, they just rip them apart. Um, but you can find people in markets that actually have heavy duty bags and they can make whatever bag you want to your specifications, however long you want them, however wide you want them. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to, to think about that. Just quickly, the other, the other types of things that we have are really like specialty items that we use for sampling uh, amphibians and reptiles in particular types of habitat. So one are nets. So Rafe showed um, you know, little nets like this. These are just aquarium nets that are used for uh, dip netting inside you know, an aquarium in someone's house. So we have a lot of these that we end up using in the field for catching tadpoles because uh, you can jam them underneath uh, streams where there's uh, logs and uh, leaves in a stream. You can dig it around in there and come up with tadpoles. But in a lot of cases, for instance, if you're trying to catch aquatic frogs like Xenopus, uh, you have to use much larger nets. And so we, depending on who you are, we've kind of gone through many different types of large nets. The biggest problem for bringing a large net to Africa is trying to actually get it here uh, because the, it's, they become so long that it's hard to put them in our baggage. And so um, I've been using this sort of telescoping net uh, that expands and actually the pole pulls out very long. And having good nets like that are important for catching large aquatic frogs because otherwise if the frog is in the water, as soon as they kick their legs, they're gone and you're never going to see them. So we have to have good nets. And then I'm going to show you a little bit. I've already talked about shovels or hose for catching Sicilians. Uh, Rafe and I, I don't have pictures of buckets and plastic sheeting, but we, can, we use um, buckets as well as plastic sheets for drift nets for making pitfall traps. And pitfall traps are great for catching all sorts of terrestrial animals, ranging from um, some amphibians, especially reptiles, small skinks, uh, some terrestrial frogs, they're great for catching shrews and small mammals. Uh, also, some types of arthropods will fall in. And so, uh, hopefully, we'll set up at least one pitfall line just to get that experience while we're in Corrupt. Let me give you a few other examples real quick at the end. So, uh, for, for us, you know, while we're in the field, we're going to just de facto treat all snakes as venomous. All right? I don't want anyone handling a snake with their bare hands unless there's some sort of clearance that it's okay. So the, what we use in the field mostly are things that are either like a, a snake hook, like this, or snake tongs. And this is what we spend most of our time with um, when actually trying to grab a snake and manipulate it in the field. And so to give you a sense of what those look like, this is a, um, this is a snake hook. And these are modified golf clubs, actually. They're really light and have a little metal piece stuck in the end of them. These are also great uh, because you can turn over logs without having to put your hand under the log, right? So if there's perhaps a venomous snake under a large log, you don't really want to stick your hand under the log and pull it up, right? So we can use these to tear up leaf litter, things like that. And these are snake tongs, which we can use to grab snakes, all right? Now, you might think that it would be difficult to get some of these um, here, but we can bring you snake tongs. 
But I have seen them actually made by hand. This is uh, one that was used in the Bujumbura Zoo in Burundi. This is a pistol handle, or a, probably a pistol handle, that's had a metal pipe stuck into it and it has a hook on the end. So you can clearly make your own snake hooks here uh, instead of having you know, someone, depending on someone to bring you one. And I have had graduate students leave them on mountains and so we you know, do have to replace them from time to time. So it's good to think about being able to make, your, make these yourselves especially if you have leftover pistols, I guess. <laughs> this is what we often use for snake bags. So they're very long, right? They're not a very short bag that a snake could get back out of if we put it in. We use these very long bags that we can then um, pin the snake at the bottom of and have you know, very distant away from where you'd want to undo a knot if you want to untie the bag to get the snake out. So we have a lot of room to work with. And then a lot of times for lizards and even when we're carrying multiple plastic bags, we just use pillowcases. And so you have pillowcases here. You can easily make your own bags, right? Uh, it's very cheap, it's inexpensive. The catch is that if you close it and you have a snake in it, you can't see it, right? Uh, and so there are, unfortunately, stories of even you know, talented snake biologists dying by putting their hands in a bag without paying attention and you know, being bitten by a venomous snake. So these are great for carrying bags of frogs um, and lizards. Um, they're, they're great, especially if you keep them cool. But um, you know, for venomous snakes, it, it's better to have some other system in place. And so for us, you know, Rafe showed those plastic bags of snakes hanging up out of the, you know, they're not on the ground. So a lot of our frogs and lizards will often leave bags of those animals sitting on the ground at camp to prepare them. But it's a great idea to actually have the snakes in one dedicated spot so you know where they are, everybody knows where they are, you can see them. And so um, we keep our snakes in our bags pretty much all the time. Uh, we, don't, we tend not to do photography in them. If they're non-venomous and we have a good way to handle them, we can take them out and photograph them and put them back in like Rafe showed you. But for us, we even do our euthanasia through the bag. So when we want to kill these animals, you know, we can have a syringe of whatever chemical we're going to use to kill them. Uh, and we can see them in the bag, we can pin their head in the bag, we can inject them through the bag, and that way the entire time, you know, everybody feels comfortable and safe, and then we, once they're dead, we can take them out. And the last thing I'll show you is that we unfortunately didn't bring some with us, but uh, a great tool is our blow guns, just long tubes that you can blow either darts or just pieces of plastic through. And these are great because a lot of times we have lizards uh, like geckos or the agamas, the lizards that, are brightly colored, that have brightly colored heads that you'll see even around here. They're very hard to catch, and so we can shoot them with blow guns. There are, these are some of my students trying to shoot agamas off the roof here. Uh, it's also a lot of fun. Uh, we use those sometimes. We also use large rubber bands, and so we can use rubber bands to knock geckos off walls like, like that. And so if you're, sh if you're close enough and in good enough aim, you can really knock, you can, you know, knock lizards off walls very high. I should have tried to shoot Rafe, that would have been better. Um, and so, uh, let's see, so we have, we use blow guns, we use rubber bands. Rafe, do you have anything else that we use? Take another shot at you? Oh yeah, good. Apple and raisins. Apple, yeah, we'll see. Um, so one of the things in herpetology is very nice. We end, up using, we end up using a lot of different tools to try and sample the environment, right? Because you know, if you just went out and swung a net around, you're probably not gonna catch any frogs at all. Um, but if you caught a terrestrial frog, you're certainly not going to be collecting an aquatic frog at the same time. So we have to have these very different types of sampling events to sample things in the water, things in trees, things on the ground, tadpoles, you know, lizards that live up way up high on trees. And so while we're out in the field, you'll see us doing all of these kind of different things to try and find a way to sample the environment around us. And so tomorrow we'll talk more about once we get that stuff, then what the next step is as far as processing it and recording data and things like that. So that's, that's what I have for now. <laughs>